I could see like Bargill attacking with Vanderpoel on his wheel at the front of the bunch and I was thinking this is going to be impossible and then I just kind of passing everyone and about, about K to go past Vanderpoel and th at that point I was kind of not, couldn't really believe it. Um, so today is a channel first, we've got first pro rider interview, Simon Carr for Nippo Delco, Want Provence. He's a uh, white jersey winner as you saw. Volta Portugal and also fourth on the stage um, as you can see straight ahead of us and also last year he got an outrageous result in his first pro race um, at the Tour of Norway where uh, he finished eighth on the mountain top finish behind like uh, Yelta Slatter, Hugo U, like Kjell Majan, Alexei Lutschenko, Bargi. He's putting people in the bin like Van der Poel, Cummings, Brandon McNulty. It was an outrageous ride um, so I won't say too much more. Enjoy the interview and um, all his Instagram, Strava, it's all in the link below, so make sure to give him a follow. And no racing. Yeah, basically, um, I've got my last race on Monday. Um, it's just a one-day race in the Basque Country. Um, but, yeah, it's kind of resting, but also decided just to um, keep going pretty hard in training um, yeah. rather than resting and then being uh, kind of dead legs on Monday so yeah carrying on with some pretty decent training still for another week yeah. where are you about in France are you like um near Pyrenees is it yeah yeah I'm based uh so right down south um uh near a town called Carcassonne uh it's closest oh. place I'm, it's kind of south west of there um oh. yeah pretty Pretty um, great. Stalked your British cycling yesterday. You just saw no results and was like very confused. Yeah. Um, so do you want to like, yeah. like, so how come you're British like rider, but then basically only ever ride, raced in France? Yeah. So basically, um, although I'm British and uh, sound British, um, um, and I'm British from passport and whatever. Um, my parents lived here for like the last twenty five years, so. Um, I grew up in France, went to school in France until uh, uni and um, yeah, basically I'm as much French as I am British and I've actually, I've applied for dual nationality but hasn't, hasn't come through yet um, but hopefully um, I have that and then I will be both basically. I started racing um, in France when I was at 12, 13 and then um, yeah, like I say, the only race I did in the UK was uh, Junior Tour of Wales, um, which I didn't do particularly well at. But um, yeah, other than that, I've literally only ever raced in France, only ever been in French teams. Um, yeah. So yeah. What's the racing like in France? Because it seems like it's a lot better than the UK, like in terms of close roads and like the courses seem a lot more exciting as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, um, even when I was like under 16, uh, under 17, um, I was doing races on closed roads, but yeah, closed like normal roads. Um, yeah. And I'm point to point with proper climbs on them, like five, six K climbs. Um, yeah. I think in the UK as well, it's pretty expensive just for signing on. Whereas in France, normally I think it's like nine or 10 euros, which most clubs pay for anyway for you. Um, so in terms of like a rider, what do you think you'd say you are? Because I feel like for most people looking at results would say like GC climber type person. Um, yeah, I think so, really. Um, initially, I was just really good at climbs when I started, when I first started and kind of struggled a bit on because I was just really light. Um, but then since then I've done quite a bit of time or at least time trial training, there's not too many TTs 
in France to speak of. We might do like three, four in the year. But yeah. I'm, I'm actually pretty good at those now. Um, so yeah, pr- probably GC rider. Um, ultimately, that would probably be the goal. Um, so like, how did you turn pro then? Because obviously you raced like amateur in France, like Div 1 French amateur. And then what was like, the point where you started to get better because obviously like Tour of Savoie Mont Blanc you did pretty well in and like the Valley d'Oster as well um but when do you think you really are like yeah actually I'm gonna go pro or like I have the potential to go pro it's where I knew I was like gonna go pro was when I was stagiaire um for Delco and did Arctic Race in Norway and got a result there that was when I knew like I'd definitely kind of uh, get um, a ride in a pro team um, yeah. but before then knowing I had the potential um, it's probably a, a while before um, I wasn't like, a particularly good rider as a junior um, I, I think I actually had some problems like with allergies and stuff um, yeah. as a junior which back and then first year under 23 the race where I really fought I could do something in cycling was uh, I went to Tour of Martinique and uh, yeah. which is uh, an elite race uh, a French elite race it's part of France and won three stages that are including both TTs so I was like could be half decent at this um, yeah. and um, yeah and then from then kind of progressed um, and then 2019 I got into AVCX, which is probably, um, if not the biggest, definitely in like the top five DN1 teams um, in France. Um, yeah. And they've got probably the best calendar for climbers. We did those races in Spain um, and obviously Tour de Savoie. But in Spain, we did Volta Bidasso, which is a big race. Uh, yeah, Volta Navarre, Valencia. Um, and some racing in Italy as well and kind of that 2019 season I just got loads of experience and did loads and loads of racing back-to-back stage races and just basically kept getting better and better of each race and um, yeah got the stagiaire gig after Tour de Savoie um, because I was actually I was third on GC until the final stage but kind of cracked on the on the final yeah. climb stage and I think I lost like seven minutes in the last 3k um so oh, yeah, yeah that like... took me 10 from GC but that I kind of already did enough the day after Savoy maybe even the evening after the last stage I, I um found out they wanted me as a stagiaire and obviously that was kind of um yeah a really big step in getting closer to be pro yeah what was the step up like obviously going from like a Savoir which is like 2.2 to Arctic Tour of Norway which is like a 2.8 C so it's like second highest after World Tour like did you find it a massive yeah. step up because I know some people think like I don't know some people seem to like you seem to step up quite easily but others it seems like it's really hard yeah I don't it wasn't um it wasn't as big a step as I was expecting I think because I went into Arctic race, I was like really flying. I was, is before I beat my five minute power PB, um, like right at the end of a session. And um, yeah, I was going really, really well. Um, and so I kind of went there and cause I was in such good form, it didn't seem like a step. But then when I, afterwards, when I went back and did Volta Valencia, which was an amateur race, um and won the GC there and it just felt like I mean the first day when there was crosswinds it felt like I was in a in a junior race um it was yeah. really it was a really weird feeling um because the whole the rest of the year I was at that level and then suddenly stepping back down was when I really noticed it but otherwise yeah Arctic race was tough especially on the flat to feed um going into climbs positioning um but on the climbs the level wasn't actually so different it was more 
just the strength that the pros have got on the flat to kind of ride all day at a high tempo, which you don't really get in the amateur races. It's more kind of all or nothing, whereas the pros was yeah. a bit more of a kind of constant effort, and that was really tough. But otherwise, on the climbs, that I didn't feel the the difference was so big. The Arctic Tour Norway, like you put away some big names like Magnus Cork, Brandon McNulty, Steve Cummings, like your result there must have been like huge for you. Like, were you, was it quite surreal um, dropping some of these people? Yeah, it was really surreal. Cause um, I mean, I went there and um, it was a pretty cool race because um, being in Norway, it wasn't, like, you didn't have all the normal um, kind of infrastructure. All the teams didn't take their buses and stuff, but there was a, um, charter flight for all the riders i think we went from brussels to norway and um just like turning up flew to brussels and then turned up there and there was like van der Poel and steve cummings and stuff on the same flight and they were like sort of sat at the row in front of you and i was kind of thinking oh, this is gonna be tough um yeah and then yeah afterwards as soon as i started racing i kind of pretty quickly realized it's just normal guys um and yeah actually that stage when i crossed the line i was really disappointed because um and i wasn't expecting to get a top 10 um but i kind of messed up the positioning going into the climb and got stuck behind a crash um mm. for a k and a half before when we went onto the small road and then Whereas we started the climb, which was about three Ks. Um, I was actually just off the back of the group. Um, There's probably about 40 guys in the group. And the climb just went straight up in front of me. And I saw, I could see like Bargill attacking with Van der Poel on his wheel at the front of the bunch. And I was thinking this is going to be impossible. And then I just kind of basically up the climb and passing everyone and about about k to go past van der Poel and th at that point i was kind of not couldn't really believe it um and yeah. actually bought the first group until they started the sprint and then i didn't really have a sprint left because i basically done it done the climb as like a tt you haven't come from the back so i'm um, coming into this year did you have big goals? Um, obviously, lockdown and everything ruined it. But were you targeting like races from the beginning of the season? Um, not really from the beginning, because I actually I signed the contract starting on the first of August this year. Uh, um, yeah. So, pro. so I was actually still amateur until then, and I was I really wanted to target Savoy again to try and um, go for proper tilt of the GC there because did you um like how was lockdown in France because obviously I think like in the UK it was pretty chill like we could ride outside but there it was like turbo time wasn't it yeah 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 definitely it was pretty strict um I mean I was quite lucky here being in the middle of the country um like small village I was even though I think it was a kilometer um kind of radius you were allowed to go but i was able to go off running kind of um close to home on some like good tracks and stuff um so i did that and then also at that time i was still working and um you're actually allowed to commute to work on a bike um oh. so that was like 30 well shortest way is like 20k but depending you could it's sort of between 20 and 30k there and back so that was actually <laughs> for once it was a, a yeah. positive thing I mean to go to work um uh, so it meant I was able to drive my bike a bit but then obviously I was still kind of doing the Zwift and um in a team doing that but I didn't actually do that many races um did some specific stuff but yeah mainly just took it a bit easy took some time to um rest a bit and um i actually came out of it on really good form and then we come to the big one the la grandissima um were you going for gc from the from day one then was that the plan no i didn't really have any plan for it to be honest i was um 
yeah, it, it was kind of the team um, were telling me um, just go there to get experience in a in a long stage race with a high level. And um, f- like from what I'd heard about the race as well, it was a really high level race, really tough to do anything on the climb. So I, I really didn't know what, what to expect. I was half expecting to find it really hard and um, yeah. not really be able to get a result or maybe just try to go in the break or whatever. But um, in the end, got the good good uh, result on stage two. And then, yeah, from there, it just ended up, um, well, ended up in the white jersey and then kind of had to go for the GC from there, basically. Yeah, because normally, I mean, Portugal, like Volta Portugal has like a pretty bad reputation with like number of positive tech cases and all the rest of it. And I feel like it's seen as one of those races where it's just like a bit rogue. But I think this year it was different because it wasn't all Portuguese teams. Like normally it's like 100% Portuguese teams. But this year it seemed a bit different because there's a lot more like pro Conti teams turning up. But stage mm-hmm. two, I think you were the fastest climber on Strava. Someone sent me a message said Simon Gart just set fastest time on Strava, like he's flying. So I was like, I need to get you on the interview. So what happened on that? Because I reckon you surely had it in a bag without the chain coming off and with like two k to go. Yeah, that was kind of um, so. Yeah, or like like you said, the the Volta Portugal's. Um, all I'd heard about it before was um, um, from like teammates in amateur team that I was in before who had done it with Army de Terre and who were just saying it was ridiculously hard and like as soon as you hit the climbs they were doing like seven watts per kilo trying to hang <laughs> on um, and yeah I think yeah, I think I watched a YouTube video about it as well um, and um so yeah i was going there and thinking it was going to be really hard um and then stage two was like the first mountain stage and um second to last climb um kind of the race blew apart and we ended up a group of about 30 of us um going to foot the final climb um river break there was five guys or four or five guys up the road in about a minute and started this climb was, I think, 7Ks, about 6 7%. And um, after about a K and a half, I was feeling really good. And um, just thought I'd give it a go attacking. To be honest, when I attacked, I kind of thought it was um, one of those stupid attacks you see, like, young riders do um, when it's, like, in the off riding on the front and they just do, like, a yeah. 1K head and then... <laughs> get a spout of the back I was kind of half expecting that to happen and then obviously attacked and one guy went with me and um kind of stayed with me for about a k and then when we got to the steep bit I dropped him and um yeah just kept going kind of full gas all the way to the top uh, with about 2k to go I was getting really close to the two guys that were left in front uh, I think I was about 20 or 30 seconds behind them and then um there was a bit of a flatter bit so got the got in the big chain ring and then just before the 2k mark um kicked up again so shifted down and my chain just dropped dropped off um and yeah couldn't get it back on had to like get off and um put it back on and then another rider caught me um who I thought was the same guy that I just dropped, but in fact, it was one of his teammates who had attacked from behind. So um, I like went straight past him and kind of towed him to the final K and then he just um, dropped me from there because I was, I was assuming he was the same guy that I just dropped, but yeah. in the end, he was team leader. Um, so yeah, ended up with fourth on the stage, but um, yeah, it was pretty good performance I think um I probably wasn't really expecting that and um yeah the team were really pleased and got the white jersey as well so pretty cool yeah because I mean the guy who won it Antuna she was world tour with CCC last year so it was like pretty crazy level and then the next big climb was the Torre Govilha which I think is it was like 2,000 meters or something crazy wasn't it 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was really tough day. Um, I didn't like the second day. I had, I had really good legs to be fair, um, and I think I'd have needed really good legs on the Torre climb to um, be in the first group again. And I just kind of, I wasn't bad, but I wasn't on a great day. And it was a bit of a strange climb where um, it was. 20 k's in total but the first 8 k was the toughest bit and then after 8 k you kind of came onto this plateau and it was just block headwind um the last 12 k um and our ds actually told us that um basically you had to race to the that 12 k to go point and just go full gas to the x afterwards once you got to the headwind bit it was impossible to make a difference but it was yeah kind of difficult to do that knowing you still got 12 k's of climbing to go and i didn't go with the very front group there was about 10 guys um and ended up in the second group and then once we got to the headwind bit the two groups basically just stayed at a similar distance the front group kind of gapped us yeah. a bit more and end ended up losing like I think two and a half or three minutes on GC there. Plus I'd lost the day before I got a puncher of five Ks to go and lost like a minute and a half as well there. Um, so yeah, that kind of put me down quite a bit on, well, from after the second stage where I was 10th on GC, I was down in 20th, I think after that stage. So it was a bit disappointing, but then, in the white jersey, I think I, by that point I was about seven minutes ahead. So at least that was yeah. kind of going well. The last day TT, how was that? Um, obviously, you said you're working on your TT position quite a lot. I thought I saw, I thought I saw like custom extensions and stuff. Did the team sort you out with that, or was that like your own stuff? Yeah, no, that, that's um, a couple of people asked me about that actually. They're not actually custom. Their um, look have made these extensions that they're just kind of really adjustable they're, they're they're kind of the length is i guess telescopic so um yes. you bend them and then you can the very end of them is kind of like a normal round tube um which pivots so and then the whole thing pivots as well so you can basically adjust them in any direction and um and then they're kind of like um a half moon shape so if you adjust them right they end up basically like custom extensions but that you can yeah. adjust and they look like custom extensions but they're actually just the standard the standard ones we've got um yeah so i got got able to get the position pretty dialed for that so um what are your ambitions for like obviously next season you're staying at nippo again are you planning on like really targeting certain gc races or do you not know what the invites are for next year? Um, I don't know specifically what the invites are. I mean, I think they're targeting to get an invite to Grand Tour um, within, um, if not next year, then the year after, um, which that would be really a big goal if they did. Um, yeah. But otherwise, normally they have like a couple of World Tour stage races on the calendar. I think this year... They did Paris Nice, and then they do do Tour de Suisse as well. Um, so, I, like, if um, all everything goes to plan, then next year, hope go to those, and um, yeah, maybe GC. I don't know. Probably have to see what level I'm at, but definitely yeah. I aim for those and do what I can. Go. That's the interview with Simon Carr done. Thanks a lot, Simon. It was a class interview. Um, hit all his social media is obviously below. Um, so check him out on Instagram and Strava and stuff. He's an absolute hitter. And I'm sure he'll be winning some big races in the future. As you know, most of my predictions so far have gone very, very well. And I've made a video about someone who's going to win a race. They generally do. So hopefully with a full-scale interview, he'll be winning the tour in a couple of years. But anyway, cheers for watching. And we'll see you in the next one.